Okay, shall we start, everyone? Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Might as well get started. There's always more questions than there is time, so we might as well uh, get going. Yeah. So, uh, question number one. Uh, so, um, okay, dear Ajahn, is it possible to practice uh, Anapanasati while walking? Uh, I think walking distills the mind a little, but somehow I can't imagine reaching the ultimate via walking meditation. Yeah. So uh, I think I would argue that Anapanasati is not really suitable for walking meditation. Yeah. And that's why it says uh, at the very beginning of the sutta, it says uh, you sit down. Yeah, I think there's a reason for that. Uh, and that would be considered the usual posture for uh, uh, breath meditation. Yeah. So, uh, but again, you know, the, the, everyone is a bit different. Uh, and I know people who have done breath meditation while walking. So one can try. And uh, maybe if you are feeling very peaceful and you're walking very peacefully, uh, maybe it is possible to do that. Uh, but normally I would not recommend it. I would say this is a sitting meditation. And then <clears throat> while you're walking, as we said before, I think I would recommend doing something else. <clears throat> some other kind of meditation, like just contemplating or uh, whatever, something like that. Uh, okay, I think we have probably talked about that a little bit before, so we'll leave it to one side. Uh, uh, next question. Uh, okay. Mm. All right, so this is a different handwriting, so we go to the different handwriting. Uh, 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 here, as I noticed that the... Um, Instructions on meditation by the Buddha was interpreted so many ways by the practitioners uh, and teaching, I am a new practitioner, and it is rather confusing for me. In the Anapanasati Sutta, we are instructed to sit cross-legged, set the body straight, and establish mindfulness in front of them. Basically, two preliminary steps before doing the breath meditation. Um, our teacher will introduce doing some physical exercise. Uh, some teacher will feel exercise to relax the body first uh, before sitting down and loosening the muscles. Uh, then sit down and do body scanning to calm the mind. Then meta meditation to gladden the mind. And then only do breath meditation. Also, Parimukkang uh, was interpreted as establishing mindfulness on the face. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Malay, mukha, malay for the face. Yeah? Mukha is one of those Pali words that goes everywhere. Uh, uh, which houses <laughs> eye, ear, nose, tongue, and skin, meaning the five sensing, meaning established in mindfulness on the five senses. What should I do? <laughs> so uh, the, sometimes these are just different ways of really doing the same thing here. Yeah? Yeah, so you are saying that uh, you have some teacher uh, doing some physical exercise to relax the body before sitting down to loosen the muscles. Uh, yes, you can do some physical exercise if you want to. It can be, maybe it can be useful to do some yoga or whatever. Uh, and sometimes yoga can also be like an intermediate step to calm the mind. Uh, because when you do yoga, you are pretty focused on what you're doing. So that can be a nice intermediate step. So that is perfectly okay, especially if you come from a busy day and uh, you know, you're feeling a bit tired or you're feeling a bit um, scattered or whatever. Some of these intermediate things can be good. And also, as you say, for loosening the muscles maybe. Sit down to do body scanning to calm the mind. Yes, you can do body scanning to calm the mind. No problem at all. That can be an initial stage. Ajahn Brahm also teaches that. And I think that can be very useful. Uh, you learn to be compassionate towards yourself. You learn to relax properly. So no problem at all. Then do metta meditation to gladden the mind. Yes, that is also perfectly okay. And you can do all of these things. And then finally do the breath meditation. All of these things are perfectly fine. Yeah. So uh, these are just different ways. What matters is that you get a sense of calm and you get a sense of happy mind state. That is what matters. Exactly how you achieve that will vary a lot from person to person. Remember, it is the results that are important, not the way you achieve those results. Uh, a calm state of mind and a reasonably happy state of mind. So all of this is perfectly fine. And you're no problems at all. You can do it, do it this way. Uh, don't have to follow any particular system. 
Sometimes in Buddhism, we focus too much on systems, uh, but sometimes it's better to be maybe a bit more flexible. Uh, then you have the idea of uh, some of, uh, let's see, what were you saying again? Uh, Parimukkang as establishing mindfulness on the face. Um, yes, so, okay. Um, which has, so meaning the five senses. Um, well, not really. I mean, the five senses, you, you don't, I mean, when, even though you are establishing mindfulness on the face, uh, you, you wouldn't be involving the taste sense so much, right? It's not as if you are tasting anything, hopefully. I don't know if you are eating a lolly or something while you are doing the meditation. Hopefully, please don't do that. That's going to be, not be a very good idea. And hopefully the sense of smell, you don't smell all that much when you're just sitting there. And so I wouldn't say the five senses are activated so much. So even if your perception or mindfulness is on the face, usually it just means feeling the skin. That's usually what it means. Yeah, you don't you close your eyes, you don't see very much, and you don't necessarily kind of put your attention on the hearing. So really, I would say that that means you're feeling the skin. And when you're feeling the skin, then the most notice noticeable part is where the skin is contacted by something. And of course, the skin is contacted by the breath, and so you tend to feel the breath. Yeah? That is why they say in the commentaries that you uh, place the attention on the tip of the nose, the nas agga, because that is where you experience the breath the most. That would be one of the most prominent feelings that you have at that particular time. So uh, it's a little bit strange to talk about experience in the five senses. I don't really understand what, what the idea is there, to be honest with you. And uh, it goes against, certainly goes against the commentary, goes against what I have been taught almost everywhere else. So uh, I would say, don't worry too much. The point is to be aware of the breath. Yeah? It doesn't matter where you are aware of the breath. Uh, what matters is that you notice the breath. It is called breath meditation for a reason, because you're supposed to have awareness of the breath. Uh, that is the important point. Uh, that's what I would recommend. Uh, if other people say otherwise, then that's what they do. They say otherwise. Uh, and then you just have to kind of experiment a little bit. You have to see what works for you or, or whatever. Uh, and also just try to go with what is sensible. Uh, try to understand what the Buddha taught, uh, and then you're going to be on the right track. Okay, dear Ajahn, does an Arahant have to recollect his past lives be before becoming an Arahant? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, recollecting your past lives can be a useful thing to do, but it's not a requirement. Uh, however, uh, an Arahant will still know that there is rebirth because you can know that there is rebirth in many different ways. One is to remember your past lives. Another one is to understand uh, through insight, dependent arising. Dependent arising means that you understand the connection between tanha and rebirth. Yeah? So you understand as a, uh, as a law of causality that as long as there is craving, uh, there must also be rebirth as a consequence. Uh, so one is an understanding of causality, the other one is a direct uh, remembering of past lives. Uh, so that the Arahant will definitely have the second part, uh, but not necessarily the first part. How to practice meditation with anxiety? How to practice to gain wisdom? Thank you so much. How to practice meditation with anxiety? Um, I guess what I would recommend is probably to do some meditation that counter anxiety, first of all. Uh, the other person here just talked about doing metta meditation before watching the breath. And maybe that is something that would be helpful for you as well. Because when you have metta, you see the good in other people. You see the good in yourself, and you see the good in the world. And seeing the good in things counters anxiety. Anxiety is a kind of fear, really. Yeah? Fear about the future, fear about where we're going. But metta is the opposite of fear. We can't have metta and fear at the same time. But do more metta in your life. Yeah? See the good qualities in other people. Wish other people well. Bring this into your meditation practice. And then when you feel kind of at ease, through metta, then you can maybe move on to the breath. You can also do breath meditation because breath meditation may just calm you down, and calming down is also the opposite of anxiety. Yeah, Anxiety is usually a slightly heightened state of alertness or whatever because you're anxious. 
Uh, so calming breath can also work, but uh, metta is probably the best thing to overcome fear. Uh, as it says in the suttas, if you have metta, then you sleep really well. You don't have any bad dreams. Yeah. So bad dreams are um, probably, yeah, if you don't have any bad dreams and you wake up well, it means you have no anxiety while you sleep. Uh, so it shows you that there is a connection there between metta and uh, not having anxiety. Yeah. Um, How to practice to gain wisdom. Um, so all of these things that we're talking about uh, here is really uh, moving towards wisdom. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the starting point is always to have a bit of confidence in the Buddha as a teacher. Uh, if you have confidence in the Buddha as a teacher, it means that what the Buddha tells you, uh, you will start to take that on. Uh, then you will start to look at the world through that lens, through that way of thinking. And that is why the contemplation we talked about before, in particularly impermanence, contemplating the world as impermanence, yeah, following the instructions of the Buddha can be very useful. Yeah, that is how you kind of turn your mind towards wisdom in a sense, simply by changing your perceptions to accord with the way the Buddha saw the world. So you see things in terms of impermanence. You see the world as slightly unsatisfactory. Yeah? You see other people through the eyes of compassion and kindness because you know everyone in the world is actually deserving of compassion and kindness, including yourself. And so seeing the world in this way actually is a kind of wisdom because you are attuning yourself to the way the Buddha saw the world. That is a kind of wisdom. So this is the initial idea of wisdom. And then the deeper kinds of wisdom is the wisdom that you often achieve through meditation practice. Yeah? Whenever you become more peaceful in your meditation, uh, it means that there are less hindrances there. You are actually wiser already. Uh, you have more clarity. So every time you become a bit peaceful, you are actually more wise. Uh, and you will notice that a peaceful person behaves better. A peaceful person is more kind. A peaceful person is more at ease and relaxed in the world. Uh, so you know that that sense of peace in your heart actually contains a degree of wisdom. It contains a degree of vipassana, if you like, of uh, clear seeing. And the deeper you take that, uh, the more wisdom you, you will have. Uh, there's this nice verse in the uh, Dhammapada, which uh, Ajahn Brahm likes to quote, and it says that uh, the one who has uh, jhana also has panya. Yeah, and the one who has panya, wisdom, also has jhana. So deep samadhi and deep wisdom always goes together. The one who has both jhana and panya, both wisdom and deep meditation, is in the presence of nibbana. So in other words, uh, these are very closely related to each other, insight and deep meditation. So this is how you become wise. Yeah? Uh, live well. The more you live well, the more your mind will be in tune with the world, the way the world is. The more your mind will be um, uh, clear because you're living well, the less kind of problems you will have, and there will be a degree of wisdom with that. Uh, um, come to the, come to listen to suttas, listen to good Dhamma talks on a regular basis, uh, because they will gradually will help you to attune you to the message of the Buddha. You will start to see the world in that way as you listen to the Dhamma, as you understand these teachings. Uh, and so you gradually become more wise simply by listening to the word of the Buddha. Why? Because the Buddha, yeah, from a Buddhist point of view, he saw the world as it actually is. And if you can see the world again in the same way, gradually you become a wiser person as a consequence. So even having confidence in the Buddha is a kind of wisdom. Yeah, because you are you're having faith in something that is really worthwhile having faith in. That, that is a kind of wisdom. Yeah, it is, it is not easy to come to that point where you simply have confidence in the Buddha. So already you are on the right track. And based on that wisdom, based on that faith, you can then take it further. There's some ideas for you about wisdom. Dear Ajahn, it is said that joy is a proximate cause of concentration. You mean stillness. Yeah, you don't mean you mean concentration or stillness. Ooh, you know, if you say concentration uh, and Ajahn Brahm is sitting here, he will not be happy. <laughs> no, Ajahn Brahm is always happy. He will not be unhappy. But uh, uh, 
Ajahn Brahm makes the very important point that concentration, the way it normally is used in English, it is kind of you are forcing the mind onto something. Yeah? And that force is the opposite of what we're trying to do in meditation. We're trying to relax instead. And so it is not the ideal translation. I know that Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uses that translation, and it is one of those cases where I think I disagree with uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, but, uh, you know, he will not always listen to me. <laughs> so actually, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, I know him a little bit. I, I visited him a few times, I corresponded with him, and he's a very, uh, very nice person. And if you, even if you are like a baby monk like me, I've only been a monk for 30 years, you know, it's kind of still baby monk, yeah. At least compared to Bhikkhu Bodhi, who has been a monk for over 50 years, uh, still he listens to you. And this is kind of the beautiful, uh, very beautiful quality of a person. You're very senior, but still open minded and listening. And now he's 80 years old, yeah, still listening to people, uh, still kind of uh, doing his work. So it's kind of nice. Anyway, if someone is leading a life full of suffering, uh, even following precept doesn't generate that much joy as to enable peace and stillness. So how to generate joy in daily life other than leading a blameless life? Many thanks, Ajahn. Okay, so tomorrow we are starting on this sutta as how to generate joy. Yeah? So tomorrow is the day. So please come tomorrow. That's gonna, and we are going to... Uh, this is how I get people to come to these you know, new ones again and again and again. You kind of you, you have a preview of what's coming later on there. So then you come and you think tomorrow you will get the final teaching. But not tomorrow too. You actually, you're left hanging at the end of the day. There's another teaching beyond tomorrow, yeah? You have to come back again. And the same thing on and on and on until, until, <laughs> until what? Next year. Next year. <laughs> no, until in Arahant. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so these are all ways of... You know, just in brief, generate joy by through generosity, generate joy through confidence and faith in the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha, generate joy by metta meditation, generate joy by having a sense of gratitude, generating joy by counting the blessings in your life, generating joy by having a sense of your kalyanamittas here, generating joy because generally you're living a good life. All of these things are ways of generating joy. And you will notice all of them are concerned with spiritual things, yeah? Generating joy by having a nice meal? No, that doesn't. <laughs> that is not part of this, yeah? It's good to have a nice meal. I really recommend having a nice meal, but it's not going to lead you to this kind of meditation. Sometimes it just leads to snoring instead. Yeah? That's, the, <laughs> that's the downside of a nice meal. Yeah? All right. So, uh, well, time goes so fast. It's kind of amazing. This, this Q and A sessions they kind of disappear down like no no one's business. Okay, Ajahn, please come uh, comment on open eye meditation. Uh, like to pick your thoughts on this kind of meditation uh, uh, as compared to closed eyed sitting meditation. Um, open eye meditation is not meditation. It is just uh, uh, sense restraint. It is just uh, you know it is and maybe a kind of development of the mind. Uh, but I would not really call it meditation as such. I would say it is more like contemplation, yeah, or more uh, preliminary stage to meditation. And the reason is you will not become very, usually very, very peaceful with open eyes. I, I mean, I guess when you do walking meditation, you have open eyes as well. You can become quite focused. Uh, but uh, it depends what you're doing, yeah, during meditation. If you're going to watch the breath, there's no point in having your eyes open. Uh, if you're going to watch the breath, definitely you should close your eyes, uh, because otherwise it's just distracting. Uh. It depends what you're doing. But if you want to watch and just sit there and see what happens in your mind, uh, yeah, be aware of what's happening in your mind, uh, and get to know yourself uh, and reflect or whatever, uh, then of course you can have open eyes. Uh, but I would consider that reflection, I would consider that sense restraint uh, rather than open eye meditation. Uh. So I'm not sure whether it is, uh, so it depends on the, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to become peaceful and quiet, you can begin the meditation with open eyes. You can start, but maybe your mind is very active or whatever, you can begin just to calm down, just to relax, yeah? That may be okay, as long as it's kind of leaning in certain direction, leaning towards stillness, then maybe there comes a point when you become quite peaceful, 
then maybe you will close your eyes. So it depends a bit on what you're trying to achieve. Everything is measured by the outcome, what we're trying to do, not measured by the method so much. So if it gives a good outcome for you, then do it. Yeah, but eventually, if you really want to go deep in your meditation, the only way to go deep is really to close your eyes. You will never go very deep with your eyes open. Yeah. That is my kind of, what I would say. It doesn't mean that it is wrong. It just means that you have to know when to use it, I suppose. Dear Arjan, if one has broken precepts in one's younger days, will it affect one's ethical conduct when practicing meditation, even when one now practices five precepts strictly? Sadhu times three with metta. Okay, good. <laughs> So, uh, will it affect you if you have broken your precepts in one's younger days? Um, probably not too much, uh, because you have now undertaken, you have hopefully forgiven yourself uh, for those mistakes. You have realized that in your younger days you were under the influence by various kinds of people who may not be the best kind of people. Uh, when we are young, we tend to be a bit more careless uh, with how we live our lives. Uh, I remember when I was young, I was a bit careless when I was young. Uh, and so it just happens, yeah? you, make, you, know, you break your precepts. Uh, and so you learn to forgive yourself. Uh, you realize that cause and conditions uh, were stacked against you. Uh, and you didn't really have much choice. You, have to, you had to break those precepts in a certain way. So you forgive yourself by understanding. And now you take on the precepts in the right way. And uh, because you do that, uh, you are usually able to let go of the past. Uh, Remember, there's, a, of course, the famous story for everyone to remember in these kind of cases. If you have made a mistake, yeah, always remember Angulimala, yeah, finger garland. Yeah? And uh, so he was a dodgy character before he uh, uh, met the Buddha. Then he became the Buddha and he became an Arahant. So uh, even if you have done some really bad heavy karma in the past, uh, you can turn it around if you do it in the right way. So uh, forgive the past. Uh, Understand that you were conditioned in a certain way. Yeah? Now you have changed. Now you're on the right track. Yeah? And rejoice that you have found the right track. And then you will be fine as a consequence. And don't be content with practicing the five precepts. Practice more than that. Practice kindness in everything you do. That's what I recommend. Yeah. Ah, so now we have come to questions from... Yeah, okay, so not sure what's... Okay, whatever. Um, dear Ajahn, was the Buddha a diplomat? If he was still here with us on earth, would we have world peace? No. <laughs> people are too stupid. Yeah, people are not going to, even if the Buddha was here, people are not going to listen to the Buddha. Yeah, people are not going to care. This is one of those, I think, beautiful outcomes of reading the suttas. You start to see how the Buddha dealt with people. And you start to see many people didn't even bother listening to the Buddha. Huh? Yeah, they wouldn't even recognize the Buddha. What would all the Muslims in the world say? Would they sit, listen to the Buddha? Probably not. Huh? What about all the Christians in the world? Would they listen? No. All the atheists in the world? Would they listen? No. All the people who believe in Thor and Odin? Would they listen? No. All the agnostics? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Huh? All the Buddhists? Not even all the Buddhists would listen to the Buddha, right? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So we have some serious issues, right? I, it kind of, it reminds me of the, uh, <laughs> the Kosambia, the Kosambia Sutta, another the Upakalesa Sutta, where the Buddha, in the very beginning of the Upakalesa Sutta, it starts out with the famous quarrel in Kosambi, uh, the argument in Kosambi. And uh, the monks are really arguing, and then one monk goes to the Buddha and says, please come, out of compassion, they have to kind of sort out the argument. And the Buddha goes to those monks, and what do the monks say? The monks say, ah, oh, yeah, Master, well, please just, uh, you know, we will look after this quarrel. You just go and, and kind of relax somewhere. <laughs> That's basically what they say. These were monks, yeah? These were the immediate disciples of the Buddha. They didn't want to hear what the Buddha had to say. So who is going to, how is the Buddha going to make world peace? Forget it. Absolutely impossible. The Buddha is just one human being among eight billion. There are so many foolish people in the world. Yeah, we don't know. So it's impossible for the Buddha to make world peace. Even at the time of the Buddha, there were wars going on. 
he couldn't stop people to go to war. Even worse, this is kind of the, the kind of pinnacle of how bad it gets. When the Buddha was on his last journey in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, at the beginning of that Sutta, King Ajatasattu, he sends his two generals, Vasakara and, what are they called again? Vasakara and, uh, I can't remember the names now, this general, two generals, Vasakara and someone else. I think I'm getting a bit tired, maybe. Uh, it's, it's a nice excuse anyway. So <laughs> he sends his two generals and he asks them to go to the Buddha and find out how I can attack the Vajians, yeah? What are kind of, what, what can I be done? And so he actually wants to get the device from the Buddha on how he can conquer the Vajian kingdom. And so they go to the Buddha and they ask him this question. And the Buddha kind of gives some advice about, you know, uh, basically how kind of how to create peace or how to, you know, what are the weaknesses and strengths and these kind of things. And the Buddha doesn't really say that you should attack them, but then they use that information from the Buddha to attack the Vajians afterwards. Uh, so they actually, not only do they not listen to the Buddha, they use the information they get from the Buddha to, you know, for violent purposes afterwards. Uh, so it's kind of very, uh, so you can, you can see that Buddha can only do a tiny little bit in this world, uh, and the rest is up to us. So. Well, just was a kara. That's why I couldn't remember it then, because only one there. Uh, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Uh, but isn't there somewhere else there is another one as well? Uh, where is that? In the um, late, little bit later on in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, when the Buddha goes to cross the Ganges River and they go through the gate, yeah, he has a meal with Vasakara and someone. Is that right? Still was, just Vasakara? Still? This is the beginning, this late, later on. Just not so far afterwards. Vasakara and someone else. Yeah. He was the best of the world. Was the world If he was still here with us on earth, would we have world peace? That's what it says. Was he a diplomat? It was just kind of two questions. So I kind of, I kind of merge them into one question. What, so one question is, was the Buddha a diplomat? The other one is, if he was still on earth, would we have world peace? Okay. So we have... Yeah, so he would not bring world peace, that's for sure. That's kind of, that's obvious, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but maybe, maybe they're not good, yeah? I and mean, also maybe they're terrible. Maybe they're useless as well, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm. There, there you are, yeah, exactly. Is it possible, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was probably very diplomatic. I don't think he was a diplomat, but he was diplomatic, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think absolutely, I would agree with that. Yeah. And he always, the way he talks, he doesn't kind of uh, say anything to offend anyone, building bridges. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I would agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, so, but any diplomat has kind of limited, yeah. Sunida, ah, Asakara and Sunida. Okay, thank you. I would never have remembered that. That name was completely out of my mind. So, thank you. All right. Okay, so, um, good. Let's go on to the next one. Ajahn, what is bodhicitta? When someone says she is cultivating bodhicitta, what exactly is she cultivating? What did the Buddha say about bodhicitta? Thank you, Ajahn. Well, bodhicitta is a Mahayana idea. Mahayana idea is this idea of the mind the mind that goes towards awakening, yeah, bodhicitta, chitta mind, the bodhi awakening, is the mind that is intent. I think it's when you undertake a vow to become a Buddhist Buddha or something like that is the bodhicitta. So um, if this is a Mayana idea that does not exist in the suttas. Uh, um, so um, I guess what she is cultivating uh, is all those qualities, the paramis probably, uh, that will eventually give rise to you becoming a Buddha. That's probably the, what she is cultivating, but I would not recommend it. Yeah, I would not recommend it because the Buddha never said that we should try to become Buddhas. The Buddha didn't say there is a path to Buddhahood, and because there is no path to Buddhahood, basically it is impossible to, impossible to become a Buddha 
through a particular path or through an act of will or through intentions. Uh, Buddhahood happens by more or less by accident. Uh, yeah, you happen to have the right qualities at the right place and right time, and then you become a Buddha. But it's not something that you can actually actively work towards. Uh, and so for that reason, we should, I think we should just forget about the whole idea. And this was kind of the point I was making in the suttas before. You look at the life of the Buddha before his awakening. It did not look like he had been practicing for a long period of time. It doesn't look like he has kind of almost fulfilled the paramis. In fact, it looks like he has the same problems as everyone else. And that's what he says he has, yeah? He has attachments. He has all of these kind of things. And so uh, everything in that we know from the suttas goes against the idea that the, the Buddha was a bodhisattva for a long period of time. And uh, there is a nice book called, I think, the, uh, what is it called again? The, uh, the that's what, maybe that's what it's called, yeah, The Genesis of the Bodhisattva. I think that's maybe exactly what it's called. They have a Bhikkhu Anali, which is a really nice book, and I would recommend that. And it gives you an idea of how this idea arose in the world. It arose after the Buddha, and that is why it is a Mahayana idea. Mahayana Buddhism arose after uh, the earliest Buddhism. Okay. Uh, respected Ajahn, even good kamas result in rebirth, uh, although a good one. Uh, where good kama is exhausted, one is again born in the lower realm. So my question is, Ajahn, how not to create kamas and have no rebirth? Okay, so the, uh, the answer is very simply that uh, what you have to do is you have to gain that insight, uh, yeah, which understands that uh, uh, you don't want to have any rebirth. Uh, and the moment you don't want to have any rebirth because you have the insight into the danger, then you will not make any kamma for rebirth anymore. Yeah? yeah, Because you have seen, you have no desire, no craving to be reborn. And when you have no craving to be reborn, you will not create. Uh, you will no longer project your mind in that direction. And you will no longer create um, uh, that uh, rebirth, that, uh, those actions that actually create that rebirth in the future. Yeah? It is craving that creates the future. It is craving that creates the kamma. Craving is gone, and then no, the kamma is no longer created, and then you won't get reborn. So it comes down to insight. It comes down to the noble eightfold path, starting with right view, ending with sama samadhi, leading to insight, and then bang, no more kamma. You become arahant. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's how it works in theory. <laughs> okay. Dear Ajahn, deepest gratitude and appreciation for your uh, sharing and guidance. I think this up from yesterday, some of these questions. So I'm just doing, doing them now. Uh, of, on the Dhamma, particularly your compassion in making it easier for beginners to understand, appreciate, and comprehend the Sutta. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent. I'm glad you understand. I'm always I'm not sure what people understand. It's nice to get this kind of feedback. Yeah. Not sure if it is appropriate to pose this question. We shall soon find out. Um, in Buddhism, can one assume at will the suffering of another, especially for a child to assume the suffering and pain of her mother? Background. So 30 years ago, when mum was very ill, hospitalized, from hospital to hospital, and no specialized specialist could diagnose the cause. Heartache to see mum suffered. I prayed for mum to be relieved of her pain, and if it is her karma, I offered to assume, take over her pain. Miraculously, she recovered. <laughs> okay. Um, so... Uh, can you assume the suffering of another? I don't think you can. Um, I think that what uh, happened in your case is just that uh, you had a lot of compassion for your mom, yeah? And no doubt that compassion had an effect on her as well. And it's not so much that you actually took over her pain. I don't, I don't think you did. I think just that you, I mean, obviously you suffered a bit, but that was not because you took over her pain. It was because you saw her pain. Uh, that was painful for you, and so you suffered, but not because you actually transferred the pain. So that is impossible to take on the suffering of others. Whatever they have to suffer, they will have to suffer in their own way. 
But of course, if the more compassion we have and the more kindness we have for others, uh, we are helping them to come out of that suffering. Yeah? And she probably felt that from you, coming from you. Uh, uh, and sometimes that feeling can come even from afar, even if you're not present with her, yeah, she may be able to feel that. Uh, and so that is more likely to be the reason. Uh, uh, and, you know, she may have recovered for any kind of reason, but that was probably a contributing factor at the very least. Uh, so that's what's going on there. Uh, so, uh, yeah. It is not advisable to take on too much suffering from others, uh, because if you take on too much suffering, it can become debilitating. And you won't be able to do anything at all. Uh, I know people who practice the kind of practice where they try to take on the suffering of all other beings. Uh, and sometimes they just become, they can't do anything because there's too much dukkha. Uh, and eventually they lose all their energy because the energy relies on a certain positive feeling. So if you take on all the suffering after a while, you feel all that suffering and you kind of just you can't do anything anymore. And that's kind of counterproductive. Yeah, we want to be able to do things. We want to be able to be effective in the world, uh, take on too much suffering, and basically you, you become ineffective as a consequence. Uh, 